Sure. Um, you will hear in the news reference to Shiite Muslims or Muslims, sometimes written like this, and Sunni Muslims. These are the main two uh, groups that are mentioned in the news in this fashion. To understand the difference between the two groups, one has to understand the fundamental concept of God as taught in the Quran and in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. And this concept is one which I have spoken about in the lecture, wherein the attributes of God are not shared with His creation in any way. Those complete and perfect attributes are not shared with His creation. And whoever seeks to share these attributes with the creation, we consider that person to have deviated from the main body of Islam. The vast majority of Muslims, 90% of them, fall under the general category of Sunni or Sunnite Muslims. We could call this the Orthodox Muslims. Those who maintain this basic concept that the attributes of God are not shared by man. What we find in the teachings which are referred to as the Shiite uh, Muslim teachings is that some of the attributes of God have been given to some individuals. These individuals are particular descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. They have assigned to a certain uh, number of his descendants, eleven in number, the twelfth one being the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. They have assigned to this group of twelve, eleven descendants and one relative, attributes of one, infallibility, being incapable of doing any error, making any mistake, whether inwardly or outwardly, deliberately or accidentally, a, a, an infallibility which goes beyond even that of Catholicism. Catholics who believe that when the Pope is inaugurated, when he becomes the Pope, then he becomes infallible. Prior to that, he was a fallible human being. But after he becomes the Pope, then he becomes infallible with regards to his religious rulings. In spite of the fact that different Popes will cancel the rulings of other Popes. But for Shiite uh, Muslims, they hold that these descendants of the Prophet were infallible. And because of that, they are the ones who should have led the Muslim nation. Because if they are infallible and capable of doing the error, that is the leader who you want. If you can have somebody who will not make any mistakes, well this is your best leader. But of course, from the orthodox point of view, all human beings make mistakes. Even the prophets of God made mistakes, however, their mistakes were not on the level of the average human being's mistakes. They did not make mistakes which were gross mistakes which involved, you know, corruption as they are portrayed, for example, in the Old Testament as, you know, having, committing incest, you know, with their daughters and having children and, you know, lusting after wives of men and committing adultery and, you know, these kind of uh, gross uh, errors. These we do not believe can be attributed to the Prophet. However, mistakes in judgment, yes. However, whenever a prophet made a mistake in judgment, that is choosing the good over the better, God would correct the prophet and that choice would become a lesson and an example and a teaching for the followers. And that's why you can find in the Quran, 
uh, certain verses in which God has corrected Prophet Muhammad uh, when he made certain choices which were not the better choice. So, human beings who are not prophets do not have the benefit of revelation to correct them. Therefore, according to the orthodox view, we choose our leaders. There is nobody who has the divine right to lead, which is a basis of the Shiite philosophy, that these twelve individuals had the divine right to lead because they were infallible. Furthermore, they attribute to these individuals omniscience, that is knowledge of all things. And they have in their books statements that they, these individuals knew the past, the present and the future. Their knowledge was unbounded. We believe this, this kind of knowledge belongs only to God. No human being knows the past, present and future. Only God knows this. They also attribute to them omnipotent power over all phases of creation. That the atoms of creation are submitted to them. And so on. And as such you find in the course of their worship they direct prayers to these individuals. They consider them capable of answering their prayers. And all of that is abhorrent to mainstream Islam. So they represent a deviation from the main body of beliefs. A deviation which may be similar, for example, to in Christianity, to certain groups like the Mormons, you know, who claim that they, their leader, Smith, received revelation, you know, a special book written on golden tablets, etc. You know, he has built a religion out of it, considers himself Christian, etc., their followers. However, the main body of Christianity, look at them as being deviant, having deviated. And any system, no matter how perfect it may be, will, will have individuals who will break off, who choose to uh, follow their own desires or interpretations, which are not consistent with the teachings which the prophets themselves brought. Is that uh, clear? Thank you. We're going to delay the prayer because... Uh, Some of the questions are something relative to the prayer. Um, we have, uh, it's time for prayer, but um, we, as I understand, we will be praying together later. So uh, we, we will just be delayed for a little while. See, rather than rather than trying to go for the prayer and come back again, uh, you know, we are permitted to delay the prayer of Isha. So um, we have a time. What? Let's know what our time limit is. So we can just uh, decide in terms of the questions and know where we should stop uh, so that we can go and make the night prayer. Uh, somebody has uh, said... Huh? Okay, uh, in about 20 more minutes we will uh, stop. Okay, so we'll uh, now take some of the written questions. Okay, uh, some of these questions are actually asked by certain people. Um, they go together. Let me read this in two parts. Number one, can a man um, who works with... Can someone who worships Allah but is not a Muslim? Can a man worship Allah sincerely without being a Muslim? That is related to two other questions I have here that says um, if a person obeys God sincerely but has no particular belief, will he go to paradise? A person who has not been exposed, we're talking about now the point of view of Islam. A person who is not exposed to the final message of God to man, Islam, properly in its proper form, etc. If such a person, wherever he may be, rejects the false teachings in whatever system he may find himself, 
and seeks to worship God alone, then his affair is with God. His affair with, is with God. God will judge him according to the knowledge which was available to him. And God is the most just. However, if a person who belongs to one of the various systems that are out there, hears the message of Islam. What is Islam? And in hearing it, they realize, of course, that what they believe was very similar to what Islam believes. However, they choose not to accept Islam. Then, according to the teachings of Islam, such a person will go to hell. As the Prophet Muhammad, may God peace and blessings be upon him, said, that whoever hears about me, that is, hears about the Prophet and the message that he brought properly and does not believe in me, such will not enter paradise. Because those people who have rejected the falsities of their religion and have come to a basic and pure foundation of belief, they will find that everything that Islam has to offer supports that system of belief. It strengthens it and helps it. So one would then ask the question, why would you not become a Muslim? Why would you then not declare your faith and accept the system in its completeness as bought by the last of the prophets? When a person is asked this question, you will find, generally speaking, that they have chosen not to accept the faith because of certain emotional issues. It might be family. If my wife found out that I became a Muslim, she would divorce me. You know. So that individual's love for his wife is greater than his love for God. So she becomes an object of worship for him really. Because from the Islamic point of view, true worship involves Loving God more than all else in creation. Not doing anything which is displeasing to God, though it may please every human being on the earth. But doing everything which is pleasing to God, though it may displease every human being on the earth. This is true faith and true worship. So, those people who have arrived at the oneness of God, the uniqueness of God, and they realize that it is only in Islam that that oneness and uniqueness is echoed and its purity, but yet reject that, then they have been promised hell. Because they have knowledge but they have not acted in accordance with that knowledge. I have learned that when God created us, He also gave us our destiny. If that is true, how will our prayers change our fate? This is a big uh, area, the area of destiny of man. How is man's life predestined or is it predestined? Is there a conflict between predestiny and free will? You know, it's a fairly uh, large topic. But I'll just say quite briefly that God's knowledge of all things, which is recorded, means that everything which takes place in a human being's life is already known to God, has already been set down. However, man still has within that 
the ability to choose to do one thing or another. The, that which has been set down, which is known to God, is the choice which He would make. That is the perfection of God's knowledge. So when a person who is within a particular framework, you could say that the way in which his life is going is towards a particular point. That would appear to be his destiny. However, he prays, he turns to God, seeks God's help, and God interferes with that what appears to be, or what would have appeared to be, the natural end of his actions, and he takes another path. Of course, that he prayed, and that God intervened, and gave him the other path is already written. However, he was not forced to pray. He still made the choice to pray, or not to pray. And if he hadn't prayed, then perhaps he would have gone to that same point where he was headed. And that would have been what was recorded. So, man's free will is something clearly recognized in Islam. Man has a choice. However, the implementation of that choice is not in his hands. You chose to come here tonight. However, could you guarantee that you would be here and sitting in that chair? No. The bus that you came on or the car that you drove in could have had an accident. You could have been killed on the way. So you don't control the results of your choices. You have the choice. And that's why ultimately, according to Islamic teachings, we are judged according to our intention, the choices that we have made, not the product of our actions. Because one may make an evil intent, make an evil choice, yet the product of his action is good for people around him, or maybe even for himself. And similarly, one may make a good choice, yet the product of his action may appear to others to be evil. It is from the grace of God that when a person makes a good choice and God allows him to put that choice into effect, that God also reward him for the product of his choice. This is from the grace of God and from his mercy that when a person chooses an evil choice he is only held to account for that evil choice the manifestation of it does not multiply the evil against him this is from the mercy of God but Whatever is to be has been written. However, the writing does not affect the choices that we make every day. This is the reality that we live in. We know we are making choices. That's real. However, the fact that God knows all things, His knowledge is infinite, it means that whatever choices we make, He knows. He knew before we made them. And the record of it is just a manifestation of his knowledge. Are there any questions from the floor, from the guests again? From our guests? Any questions from the floor? Please do not, as I said, feel shy. We're here to share. Question. You mentioned that God took a promise from the children of Adam at the beginning of life, or the beginning of the creation of Adam. 
Does anybody remember that promise? What is the proof that it took place? Well, for us, the proof is in the Quran. God states in there that it took place. Describes it in the details that I mentioned in my lecture. Furthermore, the Prophet, may God peace and blessing be upon him, had also stated that every child is born with this natural belief in God, which is called the Fitrah. However, he went on to say that it is his parents who then caused him to swerve from that and become a Christian or a Jew or a Zoroastrian or whatever. There, there are uh, two more questions that I think were prompted by the brother who asked about the, about the, about the test. And these questions say, why did a prophet like horses as a test test? And is there a difficulty in having a cat as a test? The prophet encouraged us, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, to ride horses. Because at that time it was the most effective means of military preparedness, and this might sound like there's something militant about Islam here. However, God has commanded the believers in the Quran to prepare themselves for their enemies. Not that they must go out and seek enemies and go and, you know, kill everybody in sight. No. Islam does not support in any way putting bombs in the World Trade Center or any, any buildings, you know, whatever, where their innocent lives may be taken. This is considered terrorism and it's totally against the teachings of Islam. However, it is known that whenever people choose righteousness, choose a particular path of service to God, then the enemies of God, the helpers of Satan, they will try their utmost to crush such an existence, to destroy it in any way that they can. And so, historically, you find various uh, bodies or individuals who have tried to destroy Islam from its beginnings. Not from the time merely of Prophet Muhammad, may God peace and blessing be upon him, because we understand Islam to have begun with Prophet, Abraham, uh, Prophet Adam. That Adam was not only the first man, but when he came to earth he was also a prophet of God. And that all of the prophets from his time to the last of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad, may God peace and blessing be upon all of them, were beset by the people around them, by nations around them. That the nations and those who chose not to follow the correct path, one of submission to God and the worship of God, they sought to destroy the message which the prophets brought, militarily and otherwise. And so the believers were commanded to be in a state of preparedness. And part of that preparedness is, or was in the past, and remains today in terms of, I said, from a physical health point of view, horsemanship. Not that the horse is the best of the animals, superior to all other animals, no, but that it had a particular role at that time, and it continues to, you know, have a beneficial role in terms of uh, physical fitness. So it is a recommended animal to keep. The cat is an animal which the Prophet had uh, permitted its movement amongst mankind, it being kept as cat pets or you know living amongst men, etc. And uh, there has not been any prohibition with regards to the cat. Okay, we're going to take two more written questions, but before that, we are again giving a chance to someone, to one of our guests who would like to make a spoken question. Uh, 
next question is, um, can you throw some light on the concept of incarnation? And is there any relation between this uh, belief in uh, Hinduism and Christianity? Incarnation. The concept of incarnation of God becoming man is fundamental to Christian belief, though we do not hold that it is actually the teaching of Christ himself, but this is fundamental to Christian belief that God became a man and died, sacrificed himself for the sins of mankind. Similarly, in uh, Hinduism, we have the concept of the avatar, the God-man, who for them have appeared at a number of times throughout history, not just one time as in the case of Christ amongst Christians. This concept is of course totally rejected by Islam because it involves something which is not only against the teachings of the prophets but something which is illogical and unreasonable. It goes against man's common sense that the Creator could become the created. I know people like to raise the issue, well, isn't God able to do all things? And this becomes the justification for God becoming a man. Because if you ask the average Muslim, is God not able to do all things? You say, yes, of course, God says in the Quran, in Allah, ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is able to do all things. However, when this term is used, all things, this is with regard to all things which are in keeping with God's status and attributes. It does not include the impossible things which cause God to be less than God. When a person says that the Creator becomes the created, the created is in need of a Creator, that's why it's called the created. This is a contradiction in terms. Because the Creator, God, He is one who was uncreated. He is the uncreated being, the uncreated existent being. This is what makes Him God, one of the qualities of Him being God. So to say that He becomes created in need of a Creator, that is to say that He becomes less than God. It's like saying, God means the ever-living. And then asking, can the ever-living die? So to say that he becomes created in need of a creator, that is to say that he becomes less than God. It's like saying, God means the ever-living. And then asking, can the ever-living die? This is a nonsensical question. Ever living means he doesn't die. So to ask then, can the ever living die? This is a nonsensical question. And to say, well God can do all things, so why can't he die? This is nonsense. When we speak of God being able to do all things, this is all things which is in keeping with him being God, which do not make him less than God. So, the concept of God incarnate, God becoming a man, 
is something which is totally alien to the teachings of the Prophet and it is in fact a belief which was introduced amongst mankind by Satan. It is it's satanic because the end result is that man worships another man. And anything which calls man to worship other than God is from Satan, is satanic. What is divine is to worship God. What is satanic is to worship the creation of God. Whether it be yourself or be another human being or an animal or whatever. That is satanic in the sense that it is part of the trick which Satan plays on humans in convincing them, providing arguments or whatever to make the worship of the creation of God seem pleasing and reasonable to them or acceptable. Uh, before we read the last question, I'd like to point out that we have uh, quite a number of questions that came in here that of course we'll not be able to read tonight, but we'd like to direct you to the closest uh, maybe to speak to some of the organizers here or the closest Islamic center online and you might get an answer to your question there. Um, the last question, Brother asked, um, uh, what do I have to do to become a Muslim? To become a Muslim, one merely has to declare in front of two witnesses, if available, that one accepts that there is only one God worthy of worship, with all of the qualities which are unique to him, and that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was the last of the messengers of God. Once a person makes that declaration, then they are considered to be within the fold of Islam. However, I should point out that one, that declaration is made not to inform God of what one believes because we already know that God knows what is in our heart. Whether we say it or we don't, it's known to God. But that declaration is because we need, as human beings, to make that declaration. In order to inform the Muslim community that we are in fact a member of that community. So that, in our times of weakness, and all of us go through periods of weakness where our faith may be low, when Satan or his helpers will come to us and then suggest to us to do things which are displeasing to God. If others do not know that we are a part of the community, then we cannot avail ourselves of their help. Whereas if we have informed others, then we can find help from them, likely. That is, for those of us that are from the West or the East or you know, other countries where the vices are more readily available than in this society, for example. If one were a Muslim, a secret Muslim, in the sense that one accepted the beliefs and, but didn't inform others, then on a weekday where one feels very you know, down and out or whatever, and then the thought comes to one that one may gain some solace or consolation by taking a drink because before Islam that's what we used to do when we were feeling down we took a drink you know make us feel a little up so if uh, that circumstance arose and then one decided to go to the bar there would be nobody there if even if they walked by Muslims there would be nobody there to stop them however if one has declared one Islam and uh, Muslims see an individual who has said he's a Muslim going into a bar, they're going to take a hold of his hand and say, Hey, brother, what's happening? Come, let's discuss this. Let's go to the park. You know, come over to my house. You have a problem, let's uh, discuss your problem. You know, you're not going to find any solutions in the bar. So, that is the purpose 
of that declaration. But we should note that in the practices of Islam or in the requirements of Islam, the first one is that declaration, a declaration of faith. However, what follows it are four pillars of action where we are required to prove that faith by daily prayer, fasting in Ramadan, giving of charity on a yearly basis to those in need and once in a lifetime making the pilgrimage. So we see that great emphasis is placed on actions. There is faith, but that faith has to be linked with actions for the faith to be real. So a person may make that declaration of faith, but then he refuses to learn his prayer, he doesn't fast, he doesn't give up charity. Then that declaration of faith is nullified by his actions. That unwillingness to act in accordance with the faith then can take one back out of Islam as quickly as he came in. And it uh, should be noted that of course, as the Prophet said, when a person declares his faith or her faith, all of the previous sins are cancelled against them. They start all over again, just like the day you were born, free of sin. However, if the person after declaring their faith, maybe they start to pray and they start to fast, but they start to live again a corrupt life, they go back to old habits, etc., then the burden of the previous sin comes back on them. So it means that the absolution from the previous sin is only valid as long as one continues to take a path of righteousness. If he doesn't fall back into that earlier life, doesn't become a cheat or a thief or, you know, whatever, any of the well-known uh, evil characteristics. That's not to say if a person makes a mistake. I'm not talking about a person who makes a mistake and all of a sudden everything is back on him. No. A mistake he seeks forgiveness from God, God can forgive him. But a person who chooses that evil path, a person who comes into Islam in word, but in deed, he has not changed. Such a person will not be absolved of the sins before his Islam. So, if the person who asked this question, or any other people who are here in the audience, would like to declare their faith, then it is a very simple procedure. They may come forth, just put your hand up and uh, come forth, and uh, declare your faith in front of everybody, no problem. Or, if you feel shy or whatever, you can, after the, uh, the lecture, approach any of the organizers and uh, your faith can be declared in front of a smaller group or whatever. It is up to you. But the advice is that you shouldn't delay. If you have got sufficient knowledge, and of course no one is invited into Islam who is ignorant. If you don't know what Islam is really, but you just like Muslims, don't become a Muslim because you like Muslims. Become a Muslim because you know the teachings of Islam and have accepted those teachings in your heart. So, if any of you uh, would like to make your declaration of faith, then just as I said, raise your hand and uh, come forward. Is there anybody? The person who asked the question, would you like to do so now? You want to have something to add, man? Oh, you want to declare your faith? <laughs> You're welcome. Come on for it. Question after the questions have ended. 
and uh, uh, maybe we can uh, look into that topic in another lecture because our time is, uh, has uh, ended and um, we already uh, stated what, uh, where we stop as far as questions go. Okay, so you'll have to excuse me from making, answering those questions. Uh, before we bring the meeting to a close, um, there's one announcement I'd like to make. Uh, after we finish here, uh, of course, we will go to pray and there, there will be some refreshments and uh, cake served outside in the lobby, so please feel free to join us after the meeting to have some uh, soft drinks and cake. Um, at this point, we first of all, we'd like to thank you, Chef Bilal, for coming here to um, be with us and to share your knowledge with us and uh, inshallah I'm sure that I know I have gained from what you said and um, I urge those of you who came to take what the brother has said and put it into practice in whatever way you feel it would be most uh, beneficial for you. Um, and we also want to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to be with you and thank you for coming here this evening. So, um, unless there is something else that you would like to add. Oh, I there's some literature in the form? Well, I understand there is some, uh, some literature. Please, in the, in the line, um, please contact one of the organizers. If, you, if you're interested in literature about Islam, there are some booklets that should be available in the line after, after the meeting. So, um, uh, thank you for coming out. Allah bless you. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت